and greetings cyberspace this is Johnny Lippiot here coming at you from Brooklyn New York for episode 6 in my vlog land into internet education and in today's episode we've got somebody who wants to say hello quickly here I think Hi, my name is Nika and subscribe to my YouTube channel okay and what do you think about saxophone reeds and mouthpieces uh, uh, what do you use a reed for a reed is what vibrates against the mouthpiece to create the sound. Yeah. Okay, is that exciting? Also, why do you put it? Okay, you put it on the end of the saxophone. Okay. So, right, right. And subscribe to my YouTube channel. Okay. And he knows nothing about YouTube. Okay, thank you very much. Bye. The wonders of children, right? So, that was Nico, my son. And um, what I wanted to talk to you about today was reeds, mouthpieces, and working on reeds. Now, first of all, we have to realize there's no such thing as the perfect reed. And if you ask a hundred players, you'll get a hundred different answers. One person might like this read, the other person will like that read, some people are like Rico, some people are like Van Doren. People will get so into their thing, right, that there's no right or wrong. It's hoped with, like all my videos, you've got a basic understanding of saxophoning, if that's a word, saxophoning, saxophonosity saxophone arama um, you're at a slightly more advanced level so if I talk about things like an American cut reed and a French file cut reed you know the difference between those okay so I'm going to tell you what I think and I think the best reed and this is only right for me not for you possibly but for me the best reed is the reed you make yourself okay now I can't afford to buy these new reeds. You know the ones that come in the little foil packets and they're $25 for three? I can't do that. So years and years ago I got into just trying to buy the old red box Ricos, the box that came in 25 or the brown box Ricos or any reed really. I'll play anything. It really doesn't matter. I mean this one I've got here. What's this? Well this is a funny one. It's an old one called a Oscillocane from France, right? and um, a number three and this was from when they actually drilled holes in the reed because people thought that had some profound effect on the sound i don't know whether it does or whether it doesn't it plays the same as any other reed to me if i'm totally honest but i probably found a box of those online for like five dollars in an auction or something for a box of ten that'll do five bucks for ten reeds okay but we might get them out of the box and they might not play so well so what I wanted to talk today was how I'd work on a reed and look at shaving it down um, to try and get it to sound a little bit more tonally how I like a reed to sound. Now, again, this is going to be different for you, totally different depending on your style of playing um, and obviously what mouthpiece you use. This mouthpiece here is a um, the one I've played for years and years and years. It's an Otto Link Super Tone Master. Um, Florida link with I think they like to say no USA which makes it better somehow I don't know how um, and this one came to me from a guy in London super cool guy who I'm sure a lot of you know called Willie Garnett who was a great saxophone player is a great saxophone player and a wonderful music repair technician awesome guy to go and get your horn fixed he has a son Alex Garnett who's a fantastic saxophone player as well and Willie Garnett gave me that in probably Oh, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago. And you know how much for? A hundred quid. Because that was back in the day before all this crazy nonsense with vintage Otto Link tone master nonsense things going. The money people are spending on mouthpieces today is crazy. I had an Otto Link slant sig, right? I sold it for, well, a lot of money recently. So I was very happy about that actually because I bought another one for a hundred bucks. A new Otto Link that sounded just about the same I thought um, so I'm not a big mouthpiece guy I've got three mouthpieces pretty much I've had loads uh, and when I first moved to New York in fact when I lived in New Zealand I used to collect old Otto Link mouthpieces I t was able to buy them when they were much cheaper when I first came to New York for several months I was paying my rent here through just selling old mouthpieces but people sound the same on every mouthpiece it doesn't matter I know we might think they feel differently they might beat time a bit differently but honestly, you can waste a lot of time with mouthpieces. And I've learned that lesson the hard way. Um, everyone has their own thing, right? George Garzone, I think, plays a 10-star. Bagonzi likes 10-star links. 
It's awesome. Those guys sound fantastic. But then Walt Weibskopf plays a five-star link. Sounds fantastic, right? Um, for me, I've always thought, especially as I've got older, coming down to softer setups has given me a bit more flexibility and a bit more freedom in my sound. When I started playing, I was probably like a lot of guys, I thought, if I play a 10-star link with number five reeds, then, geez, I must be good, right? Whether I am or not. If I can tell people that oh, I play a 10-star link, they're going to think I'm great. Well, you know what? That's baloney. Hogwash. It really is. Um, and starting out with a softer setup or coming down from those big tip openings really is the way to go. And I found, this is just a six-star that I play here. Um, and it, I find I can have just a bigger sound of people who play big tip openings. So, so working on reeds, okay? So the best reed is the reed you make yourself. And I believe just trying to get any reed and learning how to shave them down and file them down so that they work for you and your mouthpiece is a really useful tool to be able to have and a great way to be able to save some money as well because reeds are getting a bit crazy now with the prices. Um, and especially if you're somebody who gets through a lot of reeds, it's useful to learn this technique. I always try to break in four reeds at a time and circle them round and I keep them in a little plastic jar like this with sponge at the bottom. This is watertight and I can get 13 reeds in here and I can pull any one out, put it on the mouthpiece and it's going to play. Okay, they don't go in here until I've worked on them, mind you. Um, and I just wanted to show you today how I would work on a reed because maybe somebody else might find that interesting. Maybe you won't, maybe you will, I don't know. But um, so, so this one, like I say, was I think I got these, yeah, 10 of these for five bucks or something off the internet. It was quite novel, I thought, with that thing. I know some people actually still do this, they get a drill and drill it out, and I don't know if it works for you, awesome. Um, I could never be bothered drilling reeds, mind you. But what I do like to do is keep them wet and keep them moist. And what I found is once they're soaked from new, I soak them in water and then I keep them in vodka. Uh, the reason I use vodka is because it keeps them moist and wet but sterile because there's no germs that can live in vodka. So when I'm breaking some in, let's take one here that I'm working on, okay? So this is a fairly new read, and this is, again, something I got on the internet, probably 30 of them for five bucks or something. I've never even heard of this one. Daniels. Can you see that? Daniels Reed. I don't know what Daniels Reed is. I don't know. Um, but I'm going to show you the process I would go through just to try and see if we can get it to sound at least acceptable so I can use it okay so this is I think it's been soaking for a little while now um, okay so that one actually sounds pretty dope straight out of the box I think um, which is so it's obviously a nice read but I'll just check it's balanced because this is the other thing you want to do learning to check that a reed's balanced and the way I do that is by actually physically tilting my head to the side to be able to uh, push my lip right up on that side of the reed here so what I'm doing is I'm not using my tongue this time like in the first video I'm using my actual whole lip to close this side of the reed up to check it's balanced so this is just one side of the reed <laughs> And this would be the other. Now that to me feels like a really balanced read actually. So So that one isn't the best example, is it? It's always the way I try to show people things and it goes horribly wrong. Let's take another one because what I was hoping to do is find one that needed a bit of work so I could show you um, show you how I do it. Let's take this one. I don't think I've been through these and worked on them. Um, these have just been soaking. I want to try and find one that needs a bit of work doing on it so I can show you the process I use. <laughs> one 
feels a little bit. Okay, so there. Can you hear that that side is a little bit more muffled than the other side? So what I'm going to do is get a little bit of sandpaper. Now again, everyone's different. Some people like to use a reed knife. Other people like sandpaper. I'm a fan of sandpaper. The reason being is twofold. Firstly, I've never been stopped at customs flying through an airport for having sandpaper in my bag. And I've never cut myself with sandpaper. Okay? But traditionally people would use reed knives. That's how they would do it. And they would scrape off the excess wood with the knife. But um, I use sandpaper 220 grit, which is pretty coarse. Some people would say, no, nah, that's way too coarse. Start with 800 or 600. Experiment for yourself. See what's best for you. But for me, if I'm going to take something off the reed, I want to do it fairly quickly and cut to the chase. So I'm thinking this right side of the reed is a little muffled. Compared to the left side, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to get some the sandpaper. I'll try and show you here. And I'm just going to shave just a little bit off that side of the reed with my sandpaper. Like that. Let's try that. -da. Right, so can you see that now I've balanced that reed. Now, here's a reed I made earlier. Well, I didn't. It's an old reed. But just to give you an idea, the beauty of pencil crayons, right, having children, um, the red bit I've coloured in is what's called the heart of the reed. You don't want to muck with that. Leave that well alone, okay? The areas in green are the areas that you want to start shaving if you're going to use a knife or sandpapering if you're sandpapering. So all I did then was just get my sandpaper and just went up this part of the reed where it needed to feel a little more balanced so it would vibrate as freely as the other because a good reed is going to vibrate the same with the similar symmetry on either side of the rails, right? And a reed that's not balanced on either side of the reed is going to vibrate unevenly. And often we'll put a reed on, it can feel super stuffy. And often it's not because the reed's bad, it's just simply not balanced. So remember, you want to stay out of the red and look at the green. And the first thing we're doing there is just looking at balancing that reed from side to side, which I'm doing by tilting my head and closing up one whole side of the mouthpiece. <laughs> Right, so that feels pretty good. Now, what I might try and do is then just feel how it feels at the extremes of the horn. Now, it's a new read, and the other thing that's worth talking about, just quickly, is that, for me, Everyone's different, right? There's no right or wrong. Hopefully you've gathered that from my series of the other five videos. Um, there's no right or wrong way to do any of this stuff. The way that's right is the way that's right for you, okay? Um, for me, I like to think of a new read as a new pair of sneakers or as a new pair of Levi's, right? Would you go and buy a new pair of sneakers, put them on and go and run a marathon or walk a 50-mile walk? You wouldn't, right? You need to break them in and get them to feel... So they kind of get used to your feet and you get used to the feel. And same with a pair of Levi's, right? You buy a brand new pair of jeans. They feel a bit, ooh, mm. you know, it takes a while, right? You might have to wash them a couple of times, wear them a bit. And then they're like, ooh, these are my jeans. They feel like home base. I find it's the same with reeds. And when I'm breaking them in, usually I like to do this procedure. I'm saying maybe play them for five minutes, come back to them playing for 10 minutes, playing for 20 minutes, and then they're ready to go, Okay. I'm not very good, or what happens, I find if I get a read out of the box, work on it. So even if it plays good, but then go out on a show or play live, it hasn't quite bedded in well enough. I know it's not a very technical thing, is it? Bedded in. Um, but I find, you know, the reeds and the fibres, they, they kind of settle down to where they want to be after a while. Which is why, for me, I like to keep my reeds in a continuous state of moisture. Some people like to dry them out every time and put them in a reed case. It's great if that works for you. And other people like to keep them wet and 
in 100% humidity, like I do here, just in a little container with a sponge and a bit of vodka. So once they get wet, they stay wet their whole life, okay? So next thing I want to do, like I say, is just check the extremes of the horn to see if there's any resistance. So like... Uh... Now that one I can feel feels pretty good, right? So I'd say that reed's pretty much ready to go. Let me take another one because I want to see if I can show you one that's a bit worse, needs a bit more work doing. But um, I think these are quite good. Daniel's reeds. Maybe you've heard of them. It's new to me. Um, let's try this one. I used to, when I started playing, I'd have one reed, put it on the mouthpiece, and it would stay on the mouthpiece ad infinitum until the reed died. But then what happens is the reed's getting softer and softer and softer, and your chops are getting subconsciously used to that softer reed, and then you get a new one on, and it can be quite um, quite hard work to come back, especially if it, if it plays quite hard. And that's the other thing we've got to remember with reeds. Um, you could get a box of number fours and some of them could be super soft. They'll play like they're a two. You could get a box of twos and some will play like they're a number four. Um, I don't know if you've seen one of these. This is super fun. It's called a Macaferry reed ometer. And what you do is you drop your reed in. You press the button here. So you put a reed in it like that. Let go of the button. And it gives you a reading as to how hard or soft the reed is. That's a very soft one there. But let's take this one here. For example, drop the reed in, take it off. What's that like? Medium hard. So it's always good. You can check your reeds with one of these. You can still these are old. I don't. They don't make them anymore. But you can find these online, pretty cheap. It's called a Macca Ferry Reedometer. Let's try this one here and see how this reed goes. <laughs> There, can you see that other side again is the one that needs work on it. So I'm going to get my sandpaper and I'm just going to shave up on that side to feel that it's um, hopefully trying to get to vibrate as easily as the others. Hello, you want to come and say something again? Okay, thank you. That was Nico again, trying to get in on my new videos. So let's just shave off some of that and see how that one sounds. <laughs> It's getting there, but I st it still needs a wee bit of work doing on it. And um, me, could you just close the door, please, buddy, if you're going to be in here? Um, just shave that off a little bit more and just see how that one's feeling now. <laughs> Again, perfect, right, isn't it? Feels good to me. That feels that feels nice. So by working on those reeds, shaving them down, looking at those parts of the reed that we want to avoid which is the red bit, the heart of the reed. Try and avoid the heart and you can take it off the tip, but mostly it's about balancing the side rails. Now, as we've said with the reeds, there's no right or wrong reed. Experiment, do what's best for you. You might say Van Doren Java is the only reed I can use. A Van Doren V16 number three and a half is the only thing that I can use. Well, that's great. But what if somebody said to you, you had a box of um, Van Doren Rico, excuse me, sunshine, please, thank you. If somebody had a box of Van Doren V16 number five, and they wanted to sell you all for five bucks, you'd be doing yourself a disservice if you said um, that you wouldn't want them. So, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so you can see I've got an assistant here now, so it's probably a good time to sign off. But the point is, there's no right or wrong with reeds, there's no right or wrong with mouthpieces. Aperture on a camera is the same as tip opening on a saxophone and reed, isn't it? Right? Aperture and shutter speed, you remember on the old SLR cameras? 
the aperture and shutter speed ratio. It's the same on mouthpieces. You have a 10 star link with a number one read. That's the same as an eight star link with a number two read. So I think that's about it for this lesson. And I'm gonna say thank you very much. I've got company today because it's a snow day here in New York. So the schools are closed. And thank you very much for watching. And this is Johnny Lippiet signing out. I'll see you next time. Okay. And subscribe to my YouTube channel. Subscribe to my YouTube channel and hit Mom. the like. Thank you very much. See you later. Bye. And subscribe.